Well, this is meeting number 910. It's the annual meeting. And we'll start things off. Tonight's refreshments are being provided by Al Takeda, who got a nice boost. I don't know who the meeting was, but there was a whole bunch of refreshments already. So you're going to have a huge sugar high when you get out of here tonight. And Phil's going to give us the secretary's report. Two with 3D glasses now. <laughs> yes. That's one thing we have to learn to ignore in the front two rows. <laughs> Summary of the ATMA meeting held May 10, 2018 at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in the Phillips Auditorium. Club President Glenn Chapel called the meeting to order 8 p.m. Please refer to the newsletter for details regarding the May Secretary Treasurer membership observing clubhouse reports as well as committee reports for mirror making and public outreach. Announcements. This year's nominating committee, consisting of Bruce Berger, Peter Bigelow, and James Singh, announced the names of members nominated for board member positions. The nominees were Tom McDonough for president, Vice President Jim Geddes. As club secretary, I received proper documentation May 29th from Rich Nugent, who was also running for vice president, running for secretary John Harrington, running membership secretary Chris Elledge, running for treasurer Eileen Myers, running for members at large Maria Batista, Alan Slisky, Al Takata. Maria Batista outlined how to navigate on the Atma website to a members only auction section to bid on surplus club, club telescopes. Old business, Paul Valelli emailed the membership a photo of an Atma pin. Eileen Myers indicated that the club is in the process of re-establishing a club pin to help promote ATMOB. New business, none. Glenn Chapel introduced the guest speaker for the evening, Dr. Alan Hirschfeld, whose talk was entitled, From Backyard to Mountaintop, The Adventures of History, Best Worst Telescope. Alan's talk details how a 36-inch reflector built in 1836, belonging to English astronomer Alan Common, made its way from a London backyard, ultimately to a mountaintop observatory in California. This telescope was important because it demonstrated the importance of astrophotography and spectroscopy. Uh, Glenn Chapel adjourned the meeting at 9.20 p.m. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things as far as observing, and again, I'm trying to keep this short because we have a major speaker coming, we have voting to do. Uh, the LVAS object for this month is M51, which most of us are familiar with. Uh, the thing as far as what I thought would be the challenge here is what's the lowest aperture where you can actually see the, the extension that goes between the main galaxy and its companion? And also, how well can you see the spiral arms? You know, Lord Ross was at a 72-inch telescope he needed back in the 1800s, but that was a specular mirror. Glass, of course, works a lot better. But those are the things I think they're looking for for the LVAS. They still have a lineup for the rest of the year, but Roger Iverster's talking. Um, it's getting harder and harder for him to do this, so there was some talk about making this a bi-monthly thing, especially for the summer months, where it's very hard for a lot of us sometimes uh, to do any observing at all because the nights are so short. So stay tuned on that, but we still have a roster right through till December, and I'll let you know, I'll get you an update on that. As far as major observing events uh, for the next month, and again, I kept it pretty short, Saturn arrives at opposition later this month on the 27th, so now we'll have Jupiter and Saturn in the evening sky, which is good for star parties. And just a preview, and Kelly's gonna be talking about this, Mars is in opposition on July 27th, and that's a major one. I'll say no more because I'll steal his thunder here. So Kelly will keep us up to date on that. It's a biggie. Glenn? Yes. Um, I want to add something. Uh, Saturn occults a star on July 5th, 8.8 oh. uh, .8 magnitude. Uh, the star will go, will disappear behind the rings including through the Cassini division and in back of Saturn and on the other side. You know, I'd known about that. I didn't put it down because I didn't know where Saturn's about a, a zero magnitude object, and that's an eighth magnitude star. Yeah. How well do you think we'll be able to see that? I know there was one way back, what, 1990, that occulted a star in Sagittarius. Well, probably four, and that was amazing, but that was a bright star. Well, it's about as bright as Titan, so... You know, you can see Titan pretty well. This Sunday night, 
actually Monday morning, 1.30 in the morning, Titan was going to occult the star. Mm. And uh, I and a few other people led by MIT are going to measure the drop in magnitude. It'll act, that'll give <coughs> precise measurements on the density of, of uh, mm. Titan's atmosphere. Cool. Mm -hmm. oh, Brian, yeah, it's star. Mm -hmm. I think it's Ed Mag or something, but Brian not so easy to measurements. Which you probably could do with Ario if the drive were correct, right? Mm -hmm. Is that something you could have done? It'd be a 2% drop. So it's going to be a couple of managers. Okay, Kelly, go ahead. Uh, June 19th, Vesta comes to opposition. It's the brightest asteroid. It'll be 5.3. And, uh, and uh, it's to the northwest of the teapot in Sagittarius. And one of those astronomy magazines, I'm trying to remember which one, has something on its website. <laughs> oh, the other uh, magazine? With a chart. <laughs> yeah, oh, the, the yeah. other magazine. <laughs> By the way, it's, it's also in this month's newsletter. Okay. I have a little thing in the back about that. Yeah, Vesta was my first asteroid, and I used a little eight power uh, Edmund Sun. They used to have a little refracting telescope you could make, uh, eight power, and I was able to see Vesta with that, but you can see it with the naked eye. Uh, unfortunately, it, it not actually from won't be this bright again until like 2040 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Probably most of Massachusetts, you still can't see it naked eye, but if you get out in the mountains someplace, you'll be able to pick it up. Sagittarius might be kind of a crowded area, though. I don't know how many other fifth magnitude stars are in the area. Okay. It's How about this is the only one with a V on it. <laughs> that the only one with a V. Okay. <laughs> Steve here tonight. Do we have anyone who wants to give a clubhouse report? Nobody. Okay. That's right. A telescope making committee report. Now that's one thing we really don't have a person assigned to give the uh, the, the committee reports. Do we have any updates about anybody here on what's going on with the mirror making? I can give a brief update. Sure. So, um, a few new people have started mirrors. I think uh, uh, Chris has started one, six inch, I believe. Yep. So that's really exciting. Uh, probably part of the reasons why he's doing a six inch is because we didn't have any eight inch blanks. <laughs> <laughs> but now we do. So I was able to purchase six uh, eight inch blanks. We're working out a price for them because the price of glass is not significantly. We also have uh, some tool glass that has been donated. So uh, the mirror making uh, process is, is really vibrant right now. We've got a number of people doing it. So um, if you're interested, head on up to the clubhouse. Uh, uh, Mike sends out uh, regular announcements that he's there and uh, we're happy to help anyone with that process. Um, anything else? Um, I. I'm still working on my Edmund six-inch mirror that I started in 1970. It's still <laughs> undergoing. What, what uh, focal length are you doing with yours? What are you going to go for? Um, I'm planning F6. Right, I'm going to go with an F10 because I'm going to use planets and double stars. Okay, well, good luck to everybody. <coughs> anybody have any questions, comments? Yes. I don't know if it's the right time to remind me. Let me just see. I think. Yes, it is. Come on, no. this is Ala from Jordan, and she had a request to make a club. You want to come up and? Uh, I, I don't mind. Okay. All right, sure. Come on. Up. <laughs> well, uh, hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm Ala from Jordan. Uh, I'm a physics professor at the University of Jordan. I did my PhD at UCL in London for molecular and atomic um, spectroscopy for exoplanet things. And I'm now working with a group here in Smithsonian Center for Transit uh, uh, Exoplanet. Well, in Jordan, uh, we have amateur community for uh, astronomy, but we don't have any institute interest in space sciences. The specialized people, just four people, I'm one of them. And the, my colleagues, the three people, they are just working on research without uh, making any chance for the youth to be engaged in this kind of thing. The youth in Jordan, are just like um, USA, uh, they are interested in space sciences, so just I'm trying to give them the chance to be engaged. So I'm doing some collaboration with uh, scientists all over the world. Uh, so now in Jordan we have 11 um, students who they are working on research. Uh, some of them in collaboration with the, the people here in Smithsonian Center and some of them are working in collaboration with the group in 
UC Albert um, are used to be. The point is, I'm here because I want to somebody of you, anybody, to teach me how to grind a mirror for a telescope <laughs> and how to build my own telescope. Because I tried that using the YouTube on, on, mm -hmm. online, you know, but it is not like if anybody would help you, um, you know. So the point is that uh, the people in Jordan, uh, they don't have this kind of thing uh, of interest to buy the telescopes. But they are interested in space sciences. So the, um, the youth, they are keen to build their own telescopes, but they don't know how. So what I'm thinking of, that I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to find somebody who will teach me, and I will go back to Jordan Can you get to teach the, the people there. Sorry? Can you get to our clubhouse? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go there. They have a class every Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go there, but I don't have a car. You're yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So that's something we'd look into. She would, uh, where, do you, where would you need to ride from? If you meet somebody at the T station, perhaps? Or is there a place? I, I don't mind for any place uh, to meet anybody. I don't know. What I could do then, if anybody, when we have a break at the end there, please come up to Alan. If you can help her with the telescope making or the rides or whatever. And you also want to go to the clubhouse some Saturday night for Yeah, it would be yeah. amazing if I would have a chance to go there. OK, would somebody please reach out? Because that would be kind of a nice opportunity. Wait, I'm going to talk to her. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you all. Thank you. All right, a couple other announcements. Let's see if I've got it here. Uh, oh, where is it's on the new? Um, well, I'll go, you know what? I'll do Mario, and then and then we'll do the uh, the Greg. Greg was going to do that demonstration of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, his grandfather's work with the Star Atlas. Uh, Mario, you have been received a new honor, so. Uh, Let's hear it. I don't know if it's good or bad, but <laughs> it's not good for the lighting industry. <laughs> the AMA, in their for wisdom, uh, 500 delegates uh, elected me as trustee of the AMA. Now, my main job is going to be to try to show up. It's going to be to be really, uh, that's part of what I want to do, is really get tough on the insurance companies and the green pharmaceutical companies. But what's pertinent here is the president of the AMA and the rest of the trustees to give me the entire portfolio for lighting. I wrote the original reports anyways. So anytime that there's a lighting issue, I can speak for the AMA and denounce them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are, yes. I have another announcement. Um, for those of you who know Sai Balaba, he mm -hmm. is in hospice and he's not doing that well, so. If you want to call him or visit him, now's the time to do it. He's happy to have visitors, just not a whole lot at once. But you know, if you stop by, if he knows you, and you walk in and he can recognize you, or just call him or send him a card. He's in the a nur I can give you the address, uh, nursing home, a uh, hospice in um, Haverhill. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could send that out to at Mob Announce okay. as well. Just maybe go on Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Our guest speaker is Kelly Beatty. We all know him from our membership in the club and his work with Sky and Telescope. And this was out of the newsletter. Uh, why are we fascinated with Mars, our neighbor in space? Why is it so like our Earth in some ways and utterly different in others? Come along as we explore the red planet from afar and up close. And we do have the glasses for anybody. Does anybody doesn't have the glasses now? A right, little bit of a bio. Kelly Beatty is a Sky and Telescope senior contributing area editor now semi-retired. He joined the staff way back in 1974 and also served as the editor of Night Sky magazine for beginning stargazers from 2004 to 2007. At 43 years of pounding the keyboard, he retired from full-time work in early 2018 but remains actively involved with Sky and Telescope projects. Specializing in planetary science and space exploration, Kelly conceived and edited the new solar system Considered a standard reference among planetary scientists, he also taught astronomy for six years, that might be the shaky hand, six years at the Dexter Southfield School in Brookline, Massachusetts. Kelly has been honored twice by the Division of Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society. Let me know, you pretty well there? Okay, um, we all know who he is, so let's welcome Kelly to the... you'll ever have to introduce. That's right. Oh, maybe that. 
All right, so we're going to be talking about Mars tonight. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll have, the section with the 3D will be in the middle. You want to make sure you put these on with the red over your left eye and the blue over your right. You put it on backwards, your head explodes. <laughs> so this is the fanciest I ever get for PowerPoint. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> okay, now you can take one. Um, Al, you put the glasses on the camera. Yeah. <laughs> So, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I have to say, some elements of this talk uh, are inherited from Bob Neuer, who gave a 3D talk, I think in 2009, so almost a decade ago here. Uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, a lot different. It's a, sort of a marriage of the two. Uh, you know, Mars and, and, and the Earth are very similar in a lot of ways. Mars is about half the diameter. And so, let's see who can do the math in your head. If, if Mars is half the diameter of the Earth, what fraction is its surface area? A quarter, right? A quarter. And yet, because Earth is three quarters covered with water, Mars has almost a, the same amount of surface area as, as Earth has uh, dry land. This is familiar to a lot of you, I'm sure. This is what it looks like through a telescope. It's got these uh, provocative bright and dark markings, also a polar cap. This is what it looks like through the Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, and, and so, uh, by the way, this is not the 3D portion. So if, unless you're really in love with those glasses, you won't get color unless you uh, take them off. Kelly, I'm going to be rude and interrupt. Oh, I want to go back to that and if you start things. I wanted to just talk about the beauty of small telescopes and then. Oh, this. No, the one you just had. Yeah, the one you just had. That's the not a small telescope. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> I was looking at Mars back in 2003 with that four and a half inch telescope I was telling you about, and I made a sketch yeah. of Mars at 150 <laughs> power. This is the Sirtis Major right in here. I figured that's Situs Meridiani, I think. This is the Hellas Basin, and this is the Polar Cap, and all of those were visible with that four inch telescope. You know, the bigger the better, but I'm just saying you don't need a huge observatory telescope. And one of the talk I have on small telescope astronomy, I have my sketch next to the Hubble image. It's amazing how much detail you can see. And I'll shut up the rest of the time. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, with the Hubble telescope, you, you see this variety of markings that have perplexed and, and tantalized uh, observational astronomers for centuries. Um, well, we kind of know now that the bright areas are, are mostly light-colored sand and the dark areas are, are basaltic lava flows. Uh, but, but still, it doesn't give us a very good idea of what is truly on the surface. More than a century ago, in the late 1800s, there were a couple of um, uh, things that came together. Big telescopes were coming together along with uh, a really good apparition of Mars. Um, and so these two gentlemen here, Giovanni Schiaparelli and Principal Wall, combined to kind of set us on the course of, of what we are thinking about Mars uh, would be for, for the better part of the century. Now, to understand this, you need to know that Mars does not have a circular orbit. It has, it's elliptical, and that means that every once in a while, when it comes to, well, I got this thing, when it comes to perihelion here, it's actually closer to the Earth than it is on average. And that's what's going to be happening this summer, where we have what's called a perihelic opposition. Mars and the Earth kind of lapse Mars, and they pass each other uh, as they circle the sun about every 26 months. And every 15 to 17 years, you get a situation where they're really particularly close together because Mars is a perihelion. And so that's what was happening in the, in the late 1800s. There was a peri, I think it was 1877. It was the same year that Phobos and Deimos were discovered at the Naval Observatory. And so Mars was particularly big and bright in the sky. So Schiaparelli, uh, in particular, was doing a lot of visual observing with, uh, with the telescope he had available to him. And uh, he, he, this is the, a map that he came up with. Uh, and he, for the first time, he drew these features, these dark features that he called canali, which, as Mario will tell you, because he's fluent in Italian, is Italian for channels. But he got mistranslated. You've heard this story, many of you. Uh, to, uh, to canals in English, which has a very different uh, connotation. Well, Lowell got wind of this, and he started 
Lowell, as you might remember, was a very wealthy Bostonian who was fascinated with Mars during this period of time, self-taught astronomer, so fascinated that he, he built his own observatory in Air, outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, for the purpose at that time of, of studying Mars. And uh, these are some of his early drawings, and he took this notion of canals to heart, and he drew these thin filamentary lines connecting the bright and dark regions. On top of all this, astronomers were watching you know, the polar caps of Mars are real. Uh, they're co a combination of carbon dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide, and water. They're larger in winter and smaller, but still there during the summertime. And astronomers thought they noticed that as the polar caps receded during spring and summer, that the areas that were dark near the equator were getting broader and darker, what was called the wave of darkening. And they reasoned that this must be what the Martians have done. They're tapping into the, the water from the, from the polar regions and bringing it to the thirsty equatorial regions by huge feat of engineering if it were only true. <laughs> <laughs> so by 1890, the late 1890s, this was what Mars was presumed to look like. This incredible network of not only canals, but double canals, right? And, and nodes called oases where lots of canals came together. Obviously, those would be the big cities on Mars, I presume. <laughs> and uh, it got to, you know, this notion that Mars was inhabited became so prevalent <laughs> at the time that the French Academy of Sciences offered 100,000 francs to the first person who could establish communication with an alien race, except on Mars, because that was considered too easy. <laughs> Nikola Tesla was all, all over this. Okay, so this was our notion. Those, those observations of the canals colored our notion of what Mars was actually like for, for decades and decades. Even as late as the 1960s, there were still a lot of professional astronomers who would suggest that maybe the notion of, of vegetation on Mars along these canals uh, really, was, uh, really existed. This, by the way, is a painting by Chesley Bonestell. Um, all right, so. The canals were figmentary, right? Well, maybe not. Back in the day, when you were to, uh, in the 1800s and 1900s, to photograph Mars, the, the photographic plates were so precious that you didn't just take one image per plate. What these big refractors would do is they would line up Mars in one upper corner of the plate. They take a picture, move the move Mars over so it's and and take all these images on one plate of film. They were glass plates. And so uh, these have sat in the Lowell, these are from Lowell Observatory. Uh, these were taken in 1907. And, uh, and they sat there, and, and you know all about seeing, right? There are moments where you can see a lot of detail. That was the basis for the sketches, showing so much detail. Well, with modern techniques, a friend of mine named Greg Mort, who was on the board of uh, Lowell Observatory, got all of these original plates, scanned them, and then stacked them. And this was the result. Here, I'm going to show you a couple of results. This is the stacked image, and this is Lowell's sketch of that same area. Here's another. Looks like a little nodule, a couple of nodules here, some threads. So, so you know, the mind does funny things, and most of the, most of the canals were figmentary. Uh, on the part of Chaparelli and Lowell, but um, you know there was something too. Maybe in those moments of clear seeing, they were seeing a lot of detail. That's all I'm going to say about that. I, I can see the canals in those. Canals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was the whole point. Well, so we didn't really know until the age of spacecraft. And on uh, July 14th of 1965, we got through Mariner 4 our very first close-up look at Mars, and boy, was it disappointing. It was just a cratered, bleak-looking landscape that returned about 22 usable images, black and white, uh, Viticon uh, cameras, uh, TV cameras, uh, not a whole lot of resolution there. It is to be pointed out that this date, July 14, 1965, was exactly 50 years before, to the day, New Horizons flew by Pluto. And so you can think of that as some really interesting bookends on, on the history of planetary exploration. 
So we had another chance to see Mars in 1969 with Mariner 6 and 7. Still, Mars looked very bleak. These were flyby missions. They were only there in the vicinity of Mars for a couple of hours, and then they were gone. Our hopes for an Earth-like Mars were completely dashed at this point. It was, it was clear that Mars looked more like the Moon than it did the Earth. Then our first big break came in 1971 when we sent our first orbiter to Mars, Mariner 9. Actually, there was a Mariner 8 too, but it ended up in the Atlantic uh, after launch. Uh, unfortunately, just as Mariner 9 was arriving, Mars was in the midst of a horrific global dust storm, and there was nothing at all to be seen. This is not from that year, but it gives you an idea of what a global dust storm on Mars can do in terms of obscuring the, the surface. So when Mariner 9 started taking pictures, it entered orbit successfully, started taking pictures of this global dust storm, and then gradually things settled out. Mario, do you have a question? I just have a question about it, if I may. <coughs> How small is a dust particle considering the atmosphere is one one hundred? Sure. Here? His question is, how small do the dust particles have to be, right, in order to be levitated? Yeah, to such a, a and we're think talcum powder and you'll be on the right track. Mic uh, micron scale. They're not like sand grains. Although there is a way to move sand grains. I mean, there are, there are dunes on Mars, that saltation of sand grains. But the stuff that gets levitated is microscop uh, micron scale. <laughs> so Mariner 9 is in orbit looking at this bleak surface. And then after a while, it started to clear. And there was this cluster of, of, of uh, craters. Well, how can that be? They had to be way up in the atmosphere in order to be seen. And it turns out this was the top of what turned out to be an enormous volcano. And when the dust sign finally cleared, we realized that Mars was very Earth-like. Its geology was varied. And there were all kinds of evidences for water having flowed on the surface of Mars. Here's a dendritic channel system. There were big channels and even bigger channels. And some that indicated that there had been titanic floods on the surface of Mars. Here's a case where a chunk of ground collapsed, and the water that was buried in the subsurface mobilized and flowed out to the right, scouring the, uh, the countryside. There was a lot of water on Mars, far more than could be contained in the polar caps. So immediately the question arose, where did all the water on Mars go? Since Mariner 9, we've gone a long way in terms of understanding the surface of Mars. It, we have beautiful pictures of the entire surface. They, we know that there are clouds that form over uh, the large volcanic peaks. This one in particular was known to Earth as a bright spot called Nix Olympica, the snows of Olympus. And what it turns out to be is what's called an orographic cloud. It's a cloud that forms on the lee side of a, of, a, of a mountaintop. We see that all the time here on Earth. And so these are sort of stationary clouds on Mars because they're, off, they're at the tops of volcanoes. Here is that volcano that, that is responsible for this cloud. It's now called Olympus Mons. It is the uh, largest of... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a shield volcano, much like we get in Hawaii, the ones that are erupting right now. And Olympus Mons is really big. This is where you say, how big is it, Kelly? Uh, how big is it, Kelly? Thank you. It's the size of Arizona. I mean, it's really large. Uh, and it's, it's also much taller than Mount Everest. Uh, the altitude is about 25 kilometers, so that makes it up order 15 miles tall. Uh, that's 75,000 feet, ground numbers. Uh, there, there are also these enormous basins. This is a Hell's Basin. This is a feature visible as a bright spot from Earth. It's bright colored because the interior is full of sand. And uh, Hellas Basin, this is a sort of rectified image of it. Hellas Basin is big too. Uh, I'm glad you asked. It's most of the size of the United States. And so these are really big features on this rather small planet. Uh, the one that we, that we've really come to appreciate for its gargantuan size is uh, Valles Marineris. Little known fact, uh, features on all the planets are named for people. This is one of the few features on any planet in the so or any surface in the solar system named for a thing, for the Mariner spacecraft program. That's where the Marineris comes from. This is a chain of interconnected canyons that would stretch all the way across to the continental United States, far bigger than the 
than the Grand Canyon. 2,500 miles long, up to seven miles deep, 120 miles wide. Grand Canyon on this scale would be about you know, that big. So uh, this is really uh, an enormously big thing. Kelly? Yes? How thick does the atmosphere get at the bottom of, the, of features like that? Ah, so great. The question is how big, how thick, how dense is the atmosphere at the bottom? Uh, the, the total range of topography on Mars is pretty great. So you can see that the blues are low-lying areas. So here's, uh, here's that Valles Marineris. And also, it's even lower here at the bottom of Hellas. Even at its densest, the atmosphere of Mars, which is all carbon dioxide uh, with a little bit of some other stuff, uh, is about one hundredth the pressure at sea level on the Earth. So think 10 millibars, and you'll be in the right ballpark. And what is it? What is it on average? Six. So, so it's it nearly doubles. Yeah, that's right. So, so for example, uh, when you want to land a spacecraft on Mars using a parachute, you don't go for one of these high-level areas. You go for one of the lower-level areas because you've got more atmosphere to work with. Great question. Mm -hmm. Now, this, oh, so let me back up. So this is an alt altimetric map where the reds and whites and browns are the highest, right? Here's Olympus Mons over here. And the blues and purples are, are the deepest. And uh, here's the scale over here. We have a range of about 20 kilometers or 12 miles of total altitude, plus or minus. But I want you to notice, uh, I keep going back forth. Notice how in the northern hemisphere, this is big, flat, blue area without a lot of detail. So be, because it has relatively few craters, it's telling us that it's younger than the average surface age of Mars down here. Why is there this big flat area? If you look down on the North Pole of Mars, it's a big, flat area, much like you would imagine a seafloor to be. And so for many years, uh, astronomers have thought that maybe this was a place where there had been a Martian sea. But it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work. And, it, and more recently, we've come to think that maybe it is the site of a, an enormous titanic impact that took place on the polar region of Mars and literally blew out everything else, right? And it liquefied the mantle. And so it, it kind of flattened everything out to the, to the same altitude and made it flat area. It's a uh, hype. It, we can't prove it. It's called Utopia, but there is some other evidence, and, uh, and this is a couple of, of uh, you know, uh, cartoons showing what might have happened there, uh, creating that. If you if you look from the south pole of the North Pole of Mars uh, using um, uh, the uh, geophysical sounding that that uh, uh, we have from just tracking our spacecraft carefully, it turns out that the thickness of the crust of Mars varies a great deal from the south pole of the north. And it's actually relatively thin underneath this area where the impact would be. That is secondary evidence that this impact really did happen. Because if it were just an ocean, the ocean, the crust underneath the ocean should be just as thick. But if you had a big impact, that would tend to thin out the crust there. Well, at the poles of Mars, north and south, I mentioned these polar caps, which are made up of water and carbon dioxide. But we get back to the question of where did all the water go? And um, using a technique that I really won't get into here, it has to do with neutrons and hydrogen capture and so forth, we can tell from orbit where there is water, ice, buried under the surface of Mars, quite near the surface. And the blues on this map show you where that is. You notice there's not a lot near the equator, but there are some areas here. The laser doesn't show up that well. Uh, but mostly in the polar regions, there is a lot of water buried. This, this technique is telling us that this is water ice that is near the surface, within a couple of meters of the surface. Finally, I want to throw in these two moons, uh, Mars, just to complete the picture of the family. Phobos and Deimos, discovered in 1877 uh, by S.H. Hall, uh, uh, using the big refractor at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington. Interesting thing is, Phobos, the larger of the two, goes around Mars every 7.7 hours. Mars itself rotates in 24.7 hours. So Phobos is going around Mars much quicker than Mars itself rotates. Why is that important? Well, let's come back to planet Earth. Planet Earth uh, has, we have tides in our ocean uh, primarily because of the attraction of the moon's gravity 
And uh, because Earth spins relatively fast, the tidal bulge in our oceans is not lined up directly on the Earth-Moon line, as you might think. It's actually been rotated ahead a little bit by the spin of the Earth. And so uh, what that means is that there's an imbalance in the gravity. Uh, the Moon is pulling on that tidal bulge, and the tidal bulge is pulling on the Moon. The, the Earth's rotation spins down because of it very slowly. Uh, one hundredth of a second per century, not a whole lot, but some. And conversely, that, that tidal bulge is pumping up the orbit of the Moon. And the or Moon moves about that, far, that much farther away from Earth every year, a few centimeters. And eventually, that means that the Moon will be so far away from Earth that uh, total solar eclipses will not be possible. Oh. It's a couple billion years, so don't worry. <laughs> but it also means that at some point in the past, the moon was much closer. All right, time for the quiz. If there were no moon, would we still have tides in the oceans? Who says yes? Yes. Who says no? Who says yes? Yes. Who says no? No. Yeah, okay, so the sun accounts for about one third of our tidal force. So we would still have tides. What this means for Phobos is... we never needed the moon. <laughs> Mario, if there were no moon, none of us would ever fall in love. <laughs> Except for the astronomer. <laughs> so what this means for Phobos, it's just the opposite, because Phobos is going around Mars faster than the planet rotates. The, the gravitational forces are in the opposite direction. Mars is actually reducing the orbit of Phobos, and someday, within a, roughly a billion years, Phobos will crash into Mars. A couple of just beautiful pictures. This is a close-up of the edge of the polar cap, showing the layering that takes place uh, oh. over geologic times, uh, time scales. Uh, the Mars has these long-term climatic cycles. What's the scale on that? That's like, uh, this might be uh, one or two kilometers, uh, just a mile. Not very much. In some cases, only a few hundred meters. Uh, this is a polar region that's where the a coating of Carbon dioxide frost is gradually evaporating away, leaving behind these sort of spidery structures. These are just pretty pictures I wanted to show you. Some dunes fields. This is a, an avalanche. Uh, this is the top of the canyon wall over here on the left. It's cascading down the canyon wall. This is a uh, little landslide caught in the act. This is a dust devil on Mars uh, caught from orbit. Uh, this is the dust devil here. The white is the dust devil. This is not its shadow. This is the track of the dust devil across the surface of Mars where it has scoured away the light colored dust that's on top. Uh, very, very cool photo. Uh, this is a, uh, a inside of a crater wall showing uh, gullies that are cascading down the side. This is one of the exciting new areas right now. Uh, these seem to change uh, within the time frame of our spacecraft taking pictures of it. So we don't know, we, we'd like to think that it's water emerging from beneath the surface of Mars and cascading down these walls. Maybe not. Maybe they're just rock falls trickling down the dry canyon walls. Maybe it has to do with a, a coating of carbon dioxide frost in the wintertime. We're not really sure. Are uh, those color corrected? Uh, no, I'd say this is color enhanced. This is a little strong for the color, but it's, it's roughly. This one, this one back here, uh, that's definitely false. That's definitely false. Okay. Uh, back in the Mar one of the things that Mariner and I discovered was this very interesting feature that uh, the funny thing is you look at the original NASA caption and it says, hey, and here's a rock feature that looks like a face. Ha ha. You know? And it, it took on a life of its own. This face on Mars consumed all of us for a very long time. Books have been written about it. Uh, conspiracy theories coming out of the woodwork. Uh, eventually, well, what happened was that there was a long period of time where after Mariner 9, we didn't have any better pictures of it. And so there was the conspiracy theorists, and I knew some of them, uh, said NASA has actually taken pictures of it, but they won't let us see them. Because it is, the, the notion is, this is a face built on Mars by the Martians to let us, let us on Earth know that Mars is inhabited. 
How the Martians knew what our faces looked like, I have no idea. <laughs> but when we finally did go back to Mars and take a really good picture of it, it's just a beat up rock formation. It's oh. just a beat up face. Sorry to shatter your dreams, but that's the truth. Okay. Um, we now have, in addition to these orbiters, we have a whole bunch of, of landers over the course of uh, several uh, decades that have landed. I include one down here in the lower left, Mars 3. Uh, Mars 3 was sent by the Soviets to the uh, to Mars, as, as they typically did in an orbiter-lander <coughs> combination. Arrived in 1971, which was the same time that Mariner 9 arrived there. And it landed on Mars. This is, a, this is obviously a replica. Mars 3 is the first spacecraft to successfully land on Mars. And it did it five years before the Vikings did. Unfortunately, remember that global dust storm that was going on? Yeah, it did in poor Mars 3. It transmitted for about 20 seconds and then stopped. The fact that it transmitted meant that it had to have landed, opened up, and done all the things it was supposed to do. Never returned any pictures, but it did land. We have since, using our uh, uh, Mars reconnaissance orbiter, we have seen the, found the wreckage and found the lander. It's taken a while to track it down. Most people think that the first successful landers were Vikings in 1976, which they were from the standpoint of actually accomplishing what they were supposed to do. A uh, little anecdote is that when the first pictures came down, they had these color targets and an American flag over here, and they rendered the pictures, they were actually scanned slowly, with a blue sky, because that's what Mars is supposed to have. But we now know that Mars doesn't have a blue sky. It's really got kind of a pink salmon colored sky because that's the dust in the atmosphere. Then 20 years went by before we went back to Mars, and that's a whole lecture in itself why NASA didn't go back to Mars, why NASA instructed its scientists not to talk about Mars, not to talk about missions to Mars, not to go to meetings where Mars was being discussed. It was, it was like just a no-no to because talk about the face. That's the conspiracy. <laughs> we went back with uh, Pathfinder in 1997, and this is where you get to put on your glasses. Red goes on the left. All right, this is just to get you warmed up. This is uh, Mars Odyssey, which is a spacecraft that uh, has been orbiting since 2001. <coughs> this is a test. You should be able to see a crater with fractures uh, going through it there. Uh, the, cra the cracks appeared after the crater formed because they're uh, cutting through the crater. Here's a hill. All right, this is a meridiani climb. Uh, would make a nice swimming hole. Here's a cluster of craters. Uh, probably these are these are actually collapsed pits uh, along the fractures. Um, it happens pretty commonly on the on the place. Here is a, uh, a landslide that has uh, cascaded down. Here's the top of the cliff. Here's the wall. Here's the floor, and this is the tongue of material that cascaded on the floor. This is one of those giant uh, flood channels, now very dry, but at the time, the water came with enough force to just scour the countryside. There have been only a few floods on the Earth, comparable. Uh, one of them was the, the uh, breaching of what's called Lake Missoula up in the state northwest, uh, on what's now the Columbia River uh, Plateau. Well, we landed with Mars Pathfinder, and uh, it had two cameras to take stereo images. And I want you to take the glasses off for just a second and take a look at this scene. This is more than just a gimmick. Now put it back on, and you'll notice that there's a ledge right here. There's another ridge right along here, right? And this is only apparent because of the 3D. If you were just looking at it without it, you would not see those features. All right, so here's Sojourner. Uh, ambling down its ramp, it was a little uh, battery, it had solar cells on top, a couple of crude instruments, this is one of the rocks in its vicinity called Yogi, yes it is for Yogi Bear, um, there's a story behind that we'll tell some other time. Then seven years later we landed with Spirit and Opportunity, the Mars Exploration Rovers, uh, twins that landed about a, a, a few days apart in 2004. Um, Spirit lasted until uh, uh, just uh, about five years ago, I think. Wait, how is that photo taken? 
to rent. Oh, this is the artwork. This is just this is art. <laughs> or, or, as, or as they say, or as they say in Gloucester, ah. Um, this is the first Martian selfie. Yes. And well, we've got some of those later. Here's it coming down off of its uh, off of its uh, uh, platform there. Um, so Saul. This Saul up the top, that is a Martian day, which is about 36 minutes longer than Earth day. That's how we keep one straight from the other. And you can see the terrain looks an awful lot like the American Southwest. Can't you just see yourself walking there quite comfortably? Right? Maybe you need some good shoes. You've got a little sand doing right in here. Um, the rocks, one of the things by this point, a NASA is, is really serious about going back to Mars and making sure that we look for evidence of past water. And uh, some of the rocks that we encountered uh, in included iron oxides. By the way, Mars is red because its rocks are rusty. That's why. But there are different kinds of rust, different kinds of iron oxides. And this is one called good type, which uh, only forms in the presence of water. These layers are probably wind-blown layers of dust that have uh, created a set of, of um, uh, like pancakes over time. Here was a uh, uh, spirit dragging one of its feet uh, to expose underneath the, the surface of salts that were rich in sulfur. Meanwhile, on the other side of Mars, Opportunity landed. And uh, immediately, it, it actually landed in a small crater with uh, some, some um, some uh, rocks, bedrock uh, exposed in the in the center. Oh, Al, did you get your picture of everyone with their glasses on? I did. All right, great. Uh, these little things here turn out to be very much like blueberries in size and shape and even the little color. This is uh, color enhanced. But these, these blueberries are uh, all rich in hematite, which is a mineral that not only forms in the presence of water vapor, but in water, these are called concretions, and they have to be formed in standing water. So this is really good evidence that there was water on the surface of Mars, on the surface, um, at some point in this past. Long story short, Opportunity continues to operate uh, and, and set off on a really long mission. Uh, this, this is the scale bar down here at the bottom. So this is roughly. Uh, 10 miles away from its original starting point. It was headed toward this crater, Victoria Crater. Uh, along the way, it passed Endurance Crater, which looks like a lot of craters, but notice this little clutch of, of sand dunes here parked up against one side of the rim. Uh, left some long trails in the desert. Here is Victoria Crater as seen from orbit. And I want you to pay attention to this corner right up here. Uh, if you look at the original in high depth, you can see this is, this is opportunity right here. And you can see its trail in the sand leading up to the precipice overlooking the crater. And this is what it looks like from opportunity's perch uh, of this, this really rugged looking crater wall. We've learned a lot. Uh, there have been, as, as uh, opportunity made its way along, it, it encountered a couple of um, Meteorites, iron meteorites. Uh, this is one called Block Island, familiar name to many of us. Um, and here's another one that it encountered called Ilan Rua, which is not a name familiar to most of us. It's Gaelic uh, for a small island um, off the coast of Ireland. Now, further up here, uh, about a decade ago now, 2008, NASA sent a static lander called Phoenix that was going to search for ice. Now remember those map, that map I showed you showing the blue areas near the poles where all the ice is supposedly buried? And you do remember me saying that it had to be really close to the surface, right? So when, when Phoenix landed, this was what greeted it. Bland, bland, and more bland. But it turns out, notice the, the subtle hummocky nature of this. It looks an awful lot like what we see in permafrost regions on the Earth. And so when, when even before Phoenix started digging, you know, it had this claw, a claw, uh, with a camera on the end. And it took a look underneath the lander and discovered that it had blown clear the dust on top and revealed a ginormous slab of solid ice, wow. just a few inches below the surface. 
Uh, and, and so, as a consequence, when uh, Phoenix went digging, trying to, and its job was to try to sample this ice and analyze the isotopes to see if there was organic matter in it. And in that respect, it failed. Because the ice was so hard, it couldn't really scrape enough of it. And, and they, they designed the inlet wrong, and the, the ice got all clumpy and staticky and wouldn't go into the instrument hoppers. And so they never really did get a good sample. OK, well, we're fast forwarding to about 12, uh, 2012 when the 500-pound uh, uh, gorilla of rovers Curiosity landed. Here's a 3D image of Curiosity in its, uh, uh, under construction at JPL. It's got uh, a couple of cameras. One is uh, uh, a telephoto, one's wide angle. Up here is a big laser that shoots things. Um, and, and vaporizes small bits of, of material that can then, the vapor, while it's still hot, can be analyzed spectroscopically. Very, very capable instrument. I will not show you the seven minutes of terror video. Uh, it's so, online. Yeah, you can see it that elsewhere. But it, it landed in this novel way inside Gale Crater. Gale Crater was chosen for a couple of reasons, one of which is it has a lot of nice big flat bottom. But in the middle, this is an altitude uh, 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 map, is a big stack of sediment, kind of like pancakes, kind of like the Grand Canyon, except in this case, it's a mountain. And it's thought that this tall stack of layers in the middle was laid down over two billion years. And this is important, because there was a time, we know, that Mars, in its ancient history, had a very uh, more moderate climate than what it has today. There was, it was warm enough and the atmosphere was thick enough to allow liquid water to flow on the surface. And somehow, between then and now, the atmosphere disappeared, the climate got very harsh and frigid, and we want to know what caused that transition. And that is Curiosity's job. Its job is to climb up, uh, and it has been doing that since it landed in 2012, this, this mountain in the middle of, the, of uh, Gale Crater. Gale, by the way, was named for a person. He was a banker in Australia who was also an avid amateur astronomer. So uh, that's, that's where the gale came from. The mountain, which oops, you see over here on the left, is technically called Aeolus Mons, but its, uh, it's uh, sort of uh, colloquial <coughs> nickname is Mount Sharp, named for Dr. Robert Sharp, a longtime professor of geology at Caltech. I took classes from him. He's probably most responsible for me being here, uh, pursuing uh, planetary geology. This is that stack in the uh, that that uh, that that Curiosity is climbing up, and as it, it starts out farther back in Martian time, and by the time it's getting near the top, which is where it's getting out, it's going to more current Martian time. So these are some of the pictures that Curiosity took along the way. Uh, a lot of it was kind of crusty and very, very coarse looking. This isn't really solid rock, it's what we call a conglomerate. And uh, this is a close up of that uh, outcrop I just showed you. One of these pictures is from Mars and the other one is from Earth. They're very comparable. This is very typical of what you find in a stream bed. Collected uh, little pebbly things that have been uh, sort of glued together by salts and other things. Here's a great panorama. This is uh, Mount Sharp here in the background, uh, early in Curiosity's mission. And I threw this in just, this is not from Curiosity or a NASA spacecraft. This is from uh, the European Space Agency's Mars Express, mm -hmm. close up of Phobos, a very interesting body all by itself. And ladies and gentlemen, that is it for the 3D portion of our program. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to kind of fly through this. Curiosity has been on the surface for almost six years now, hard to believe, and it's gone a long way. Uh, every once in a while it takes a selfie, it's got an arm, you know, with a camera on the end of it, and uh, you say, well, where's the arm? How come the arm is not in the way? And what they do is they take a whole bunch of pictures and then they sort of Photoshop out the arm. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Mount Sharp here in the background. Again, this looks so much like the American Southwest. I just want to get here. Um, this is its trail. It's heading now up the slope of, uh, of, of uh, Mount Sharp through various route, through various uh, um, deposits, and it's, it's continuing on. 
You know, I had a problem. Uh, about a year and a half ago, something happened to its drill. It's got a drill and these really sophisticated experiments. It drills into the rock because there's a, there's a contaminating layer on the surface of the rock. That doesn't represent the sort of true composition of what lies underneath. So it has to drill through that to obtain samples for its geologic analyses. And so that drill malfunctioned in a way that kept it uh, uh, out of uh, action for almost a year and a half. And, uh, and so just within the last couple of weeks, they started drilling it. OK, so this is a great uh, uh, question for your, for your friends. How many spacecraft are either on or around the surface of the planet Mars right now? We have these five orbiters uh, there now. We have five orbiters around Mars that are functioning and two rovers on the surface. It's a busy place on Mars. And uh, they're not all NASA. I mentioned Mars Express. The Indians have their own uh, uh, Mars orbiter right now. You don't hear too much about it. It was more a test mission than anything else. The most recent addition is uh, on its way. InSight was launched on May 5th from California. First time ever that an interplanetary mission was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, it's due to arrive on the 26th, which I think is the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Uh, InSight is what we call a backronym. It's a word that sounds great by itself. It's, and then they make up this name for the actual mission that fits. Uh, and so what, what, let me just back up a second. What InSight is going to do is land on a very boring piece of Mars where there's really not, it's got a camera, but it will be so boring, so boring. I mean, we're trying to make Mars great again, and this is just not going to do it. But it's got, it's got three experiments, and we'll, I'll show you a video in just a second. There'll be a seismometer, there'll be a heat probe, and there'll be a radio transmitter. This was the launch. Uh, let's see if I can make this work. This was the launch. I actually went out for the launch. My first time for a Vandenberg launch, and I was so excited. And then the fog rolled in. The fog was so thick. This is from right next to the pads. And it's gone. <laughs> so trust me, it worked OK. So, uh, uh, Curiosity, I mean, uh, Insight is going to land right here, uh, not all that far from where Curiosity is now, but on a very boring stretch. And I'm actually going to play a two and a half minute video that explains what the mission is. The basic idea about. of Insight is to map out the deep structure of Mars. We know a lot about the surface of Mars, we know a lot about its atmosphere, and even about its uh, ionosphere, but we don't know very much about what goes on a mile below the surface, much less 2,000 miles below the surface down to the center. And this will be the first mission that's going to Mars specifically to investigate the deep inside of Mars. We know that the Earth is habitable, we know that Mars is not. There might be something that we find out in terms of the structure of Mars versus the structure of Earth that maybe can help us understand uh, why that is. InSight carries a seismometer which measures the seismic waves that travel through Mars from Mars quakes and maps out the deep interior structure of Mars. We're going to also have a heat flow and physical properties probe, which will penetrate into the Mars surface about 5 meters or 16 feet to take the temperature of Mars. And it has a, a radio science experiment which uses the radio on the spacecraft to measure small variations in the wobble of Mars's pole to understand more about the structure and composition of the core. Insight will be the first mission to pick instruments up off the deck of the lander and place them on the surface of Mars. I like to say that we're playing the claw game on Mars with no joystick. The seismometer needs to be installed in one place and basically not move in order to get the best seismic data. We also have a wind and thermal shield that will then be placed on top of that seismometer to protect it further from the environment. For the heat flow probe, HPQ, it also needs to sit in one place, take a while to hammer itself down into the ground and acquire the thermal measurements over a long period of time. InSight is a mission to Mars, but it's much, much more than a Mars mission. In some sense, it's like a time machine. 
It's measuring the structure of Mars that was put in place four and a half billion years ago. So we can go back and understand the processes that formed Mars just shortly after it was created from the solar nebula. By studying Mars, we'll be able to learn more about Earth, Venus, Mercury, even the Moon, even exoplanets around other stars. Okay, so that's uh, coming soon. Now, they mentioned how Mars came together. We want to understand what happened to Mars. Why did it become such a bleak place when it started off with so much promise, with all this water flowing around? over the surface. Could Mars have ever been truly Earth-like? We don't know the answer to that question yet, and uh, we hope to find out. What we do know is that Mars being only half the size of the Earth has what fraction of the volume of the Earth? Oh, you knew that one was coming, didn't you? You just knew. That's right. And so the surface to volume ratio is higher than the Earth. Consequently, it cooled a lot faster the Earth, than the Earth did. If you take out of a campfire, right, something the size of a softball and something the size of a golf ball, two big embers, which one is going to cool off first? A smaller golf ball. A smaller, okay? Mars' interior, in order to generate a magnetic field, you need a liquid core that is conducting and in motion, a dynamo. That's what we have on Earth. That's why we have this lovely magnetosphere around our planet that deflects all manner of nasty stuff from outer space. Space radiation, solar uh, flare blasts, CMEs, and, and it really kind of creates an environment on Earth that is shielded from a lot of the damaging radiation of space. Mars had a global magnetic field. We know that now. We can see these bands of alternating magnetic polarity, maybe the beginnings of plate tectonism and field reversals on Mars, but no longer. Whatever magnetic field Mars had globally <coughs> snuffed out four billion years ago. And consequently, if you think about a, your typical blast from the sun coming toward the Earth, right, when that solar wave hits the Earth in the solar wind, it is deflected around our magnetosphere. It never really gets close to Earth itself. Now, picture Mars. It doesn't have a magnetic field, so when that same blast wave hits Mars, it encounters the atmosphere directly. And it's, it's going at supersonic speeds. It strips away the atmosphere of Mars. Over time, the atmosphere of Mars has been bled away into interplanetary space. Uh, I won't get into this now in the interest of time, but there are several ways that the atmosphere has been lost over time. And so consequently, Mars, one of the things we now know about Mars is that it didn't, it used to have a thicker atmosphere and there, it, is a, it has been irretrievably lost. But there are hints that Mars might not quite be dead yet, in the words of Monty Python. <laughs> um, we can see from Earth, methane uh, is a gas that has really strong spectral signature. It's very easy to detect. In fact, if you were flying by Earth in a spacecraft and wanted to prove that there were life here on Earth, you would sense methane. You would detect the methane because methane and the oxygen in our atmosphere should not coexist. It must mean that the methane is constantly being replenished. And lo and behold, we see places on Mars where there are clouds of methane and they seem to be localized. Does this mean that that there is, is life there? We don't know yet. Just this past week in Science was published this result showing that over the course of a Martian year, this is up here, over three different Martian years, we see a cycle in the amount of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Right? It's, it's strongest in, or in local summer and autumn. Where does this methane come from? Well, it could be coming from uh, deep down inside. It could be produced abiotically, not having anything to do with life. Or maybe it does have to do with life. We don't know. This is a result from Curiosity, by the way. So this is a measurement that has been made on the surface of Mars over three Martian years. So this quest for life on Mars continues. And it's not going to be solved anytime soon. The next wave of Martian spacecraft to be launched in 2020, uh, one by the US, 
uh, and the other by a combination of the European Space Agency and Russia, will actually be tested for organic matter and life. Uh, we might have an answer or some kind of answer soon. But let's fast forward to right now. Uh, and we're approaching a perihelic opposition of Mars. This is where Earth and Mars were last January. Mars in the sky was very small. Here's where they're going to be uh, at the end of July when they're closest together. Again, Mars is not only close to the Earth, it's close to the Sun. So it's especially close to us. And Mars will look about as big and bright in the sky as it can be. Here's a plot of time. Uh, so its diameter will be uh, 24 arc seconds. That's roughly half the diameter of Jupiter. And uh, this is a little known fact, but it will look as big as the full moon. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that. Uh, this is its uh, nearest distance in miles. The, this is the record, or the sort of record set back in 2003. Uh, but it will be, unfortunately, not very high in declination, so it won't be favored here. So, look, out of the goodness of my heart, Sky and Telescope has agreed to give us all a free trip to Chile. Uh, to observe from the Atacama Desert where Mars will be directly overhead. Who's with it? <laughs> okay. Uh, unfortunately, however, because it's a perihelic opposition, Mars is hotter than usual. And this is a, a, a ready-made recipe for triggering one of those global dust storms. And sure enough, uh, on May 31st, just within the last couple of weeks, uh, astron amateur astronomers notice a bright spot in, the, in an area called Mare Acidalia. This is taken by John Verdura. John, are you here by any chance? Yes! There he is. He's the man. <laughs> I'm sorry? Only good morning and good seeing I've had in months. All right. Uh, yeah, I, well, I knew you were a member of the club. I was hoping you, you would come. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? Was this the first morning you saw anything? Well, I did see it uh, visually through the scope while I was setting up a camera. And uh, right off the bat, it's done with a monochrome camera through red, green, and blue filters. So as I was going through each uh, filter, I could tell it was a dust storm because I could see how much brighter it was in the red filter versus the green. And it was much less so in the blue. And that's typically what you see for a Martian dust storm out of the world. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's, this is just one of his little, you know, drag out on the driveway. It's a 36 centimeter, I think. Uh, it's a it's a 36 centimeter Dal Perkham, 14 and a half inch F18. It's Which explains the really native nice folk, native, native focal length, 6,600 millimeters. There you go. I actually had a focal reducer in it this time because the pixels on this particular camera are small. So this was the beginning of trouble, right? And uh, this is a, an animated GIF running from May 31st to June 11th. The orange region shows uh, the spread of this dust storm to date. Uh, here's Curiosity over here. Here's Opportunity right in the thick of it. And um, these are two pictures taken recently from Curiosity. Uh, no selfies today. Um, and you can see how the, the dust is getting thicker. In fact, this is a simulation of, of the, the tau, the uh, optical density of the atmosphere. Uh, 0.6 is about normal for any ordinary day. There's always a little dust in the Martian atmosphere. Again, this is a simulation. Uh, and, and so uh, this, is, this is the increase. And you can see it gets to the point where you just can't see the sun in the sky. OK. The atmospheric capacity at opportunity increased from this on June 1st to 11 on June 11th, over the period of just 10 days, all right? Uh, to the point that its uh, uh, opportunity is powered by solar cells. It needs to see the sun in order to have electricity. The last time NASA heard from, uh, from opportunity was last Sunday, and it has reached such a low power mode that it has shut off everything except an internal clock. And once a day, it's, it wakes up long enough to say, any power yet? And no. So we, we don't know if, if Opportunity is going to survive this dust storm. It survived one back in 2007, but this 11 
Optical density is the highest ever recorded from the surface of Mars. So I wouldn't hold my breath. Again, this is a spacecraft that's been on the surface of Mars for 15 years. Kelly? Yes? Is that tau scale uh, a logarithmic scale or a linear scale? I, I think it's linear. It's optical depths. So it is, um, so like, it's, it's the amount of extinction that one atmosphere gives you. To, I, no, wait, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I don't think that's right. I think it's I think it's a e. I think it's one over e reduction for each. Oh, okay. Um, these are a couple of pictures taken just a couple of days ago, June 13th, uh, by a Japanese amateur, uh, to about three hours apart, two and a half hours apart. So Mars is rotating, but you can see a lot of the disk is compromised. And unfortunately, these global storms tend to last for a couple of months. Maybe three months, four months. So it, the, the, the prospects, curiosity is no problem because it's, it's powered by radioactive uh, plutonium. But opportunity may be, may be in deep yoga. So if you want to try and, you, and you're not willing to wait for opposition so you can see it in the evening sky, get up tomorrow morning. There's no moon right now. Uh, you'll see this parade of planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, going through all the zodiacal constellations that you know and love. Mars is already starting to get pretty bright, and it will continue to do so over the next couple of months. You can see it's in Capricornus right now. It's in a pretty uh, uninteresting part of the sky. Once it reaches opposition, you will not be able to mistake it. Just as an aside, you'll also see Antares in the sky, which is also reddish colored, but it's a red giant, uh, not, not a red surface planet, Antares means rival of Mars, and so you'll get to see both of them in the sky at the same time. I wish you luck. I hope the dust storm clears up, and uh, we'll just kind of have to keep our fingers crossed both for opportunity and the spacecraft that we have there, and for our own observing. The one good thing about this storm is uh, the, uh, the NASA planetary science community is actually pretty excited about it because we've got all these orbiters around the planet, and we will learn a lot about what makes these dust storms tick because we'll be able to watch them. Uh, Maven in particular has an accelerometer on board so we'll be able to see how high the dust gets in the atmosphere. It could be an exciting time scientifically. From a visual point of view, not so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, can you please uh, make a pile up here of, of the glasses? And and I, I know it's it's getting late, so maybe in the interest of time, unless you have a really awesome question uh, that everyone wants, will you can just come up here and chat with me. Will the dust fill with mass? The dust will not fill with mass. <laughs> okay, I'll do this. Um, just want to make an announcement, and I will close the meeting tonight, and we'll turn things over to Tom at the next meeting officially. But uh, the voting came in, and our vice president is Rich Nugent, by close vote. So congratulations, Rich. I want to thank you all for coming. Have a safe trip back, and this meeting is closed.